so I'm going to give just a brief overview of ZFS, um, particularly OpenZFS. Uh, OpenZFS is a collective of uh, different people and, and operating systems that came together um, and started working on the ZFS code base that was open sourced by uh, Sun Microsystems. Um, so ZFS is fundamentally a state-of-the-art local file system um, and it does a number of things. It has a pooled storage layer uh, which is allows you to take multiple hard drives and use them as one um, for redundancy and for increased capacity and performance. Uh, it's an atomic and copy on write file system. Um, and this lets you do things like snapshots of your file systems. You can send and receive your file systems to, to other uh, systems for backup and uh, disaster recovery. And uh, the, these properties also give it really nice um, performance on spinning disks. Uh, as well as SSDs, the, the, and that's specifically the copy on write. Um, so checksumming is a way to detect and prevent data corruption. Um, this is kind of a, a, a big deal as hard drives have gotten a lot bigger and we deploy more and more hard drives. Um, with standard file systems, you're actually at risk of losing the, the data that you're storing um, in, in time. The longer that data sits on the disk, um, you just you don't know whether or not it's good unless you have some way to to verify that um, and by default file systems aren't really tracking this so ZFS does this for the data and the metadata at the file system level um, it's it's built for the future uh, the max file system uh, file size is 16 exabytes um, tons and tons of files per drive or directory or, or whatever the case may be um, they, the, Matt Ahrens and Jeff Bonwick really went overboard and just tried to make sure that uh, all the things that plagued previous file systems were taken care of when they designed this. So they started this project in 2001 um, at Sun. Uh, the first code drop was part of the Open Solaris project in 2005. Um, around that time, I don't remember the exact timeline, uh, Within a couple years, um, it shipped in Solaris 10 uh, as a production feature and then slowly grew in acceptance. Uh, there were storage projects at Sun, uh, storage servers that made use of the, of the Open Solaris implementation. Um, then people, people really liked what they saw with the file system and the license allowed uh, portability to other platforms, so people naturally wanted to run it on their favorite operating systems. Um, one of the earlier ports was FreeBSD, uh, and this actually shipped in 7 and started gaining uh, a, a large following. Um, there were some Linux attempts. Um, I think the, they alternated between Fuse and, and Kernel mode. Um, but then a, a very serious implementation came from uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Labs in 2008. Um, so Sun gets eaten by a lawnmower in 2010 and kind of closes off Solaris and um, there's some uncertainty around the ZFS file system and what this means for all these other people. Um, and during this time, the Illumos, uh, which, Illumos, which is a continuation of Open Solaris by um, a, an open source community, uh, kind of takes the torch and they're serving as like the, the central authority for ZFS and doing the bug uh, fixes and, and getting those back out to the other operating systems. Um, so this became an official thing uh, in 2013. Matt Ahrens decided that he wanted to try and get as much of that code uh, out of Illumos and into an independent repository where people from these other communities can come in and contribute and uh, make feature improvements and bug fixes and, and make the code easy to port uh, back into the, the other platforms. So um, this is kind of a, an architectural diagram of the, filing, uh, the file system. At the lowest level, you're going to have uh, hardware. Uh, most of the time, it's individually accessed disks. Um, you have your pooled storage layer, uh, which is the Z pool. This is where you get things like mirroring and striping, um, but also parity, RAID, 
um, with one, two, or three disks. Uh, the transactional layer uh, is what gives you the copy on write properties. So everything is um, batched into uh, transaction groups. Um, and when it hits the disk, it's always consistent. There's never a file system check on a ZFS file system um, because of this transactional storage model. So above that, uh, there are a couple of primary implementations. There's the, Z, uh, the actual ZFS file system. This is like your standard POS6 uh, file system. Then there's ZVols, which are a raw um, storage, uh, block storage. So that can be exposed to like virtual machines, or you can put it on like an iSCSI provider or some type of network storage. Uh, and then, of course, there's the user land tools. Um, I'll talk more, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, one thing that's also kind of unique about uh, ZFS, and if we come back, um, this is taking place at the storage pool level, is, is this concept of an ARC, or uh, an adaptive replacement cache. Uh, so Unix file systems and, and Unix implementations for a long time have had a, a page cache. This is where you use your free RAM to uh, basically store the, um, the uh, blocks and files that you've previously accessed, and it accelerates the read. Um, there's problems with this, though. So say you run like a big rsync or a backup or something. You're going to probably walk your entire file system, and you're just going to flush that cache out with stuff that you aren't going to use again, most likely. So. Uh, the ZFS arc solves this problem by splitting it into two separate caches. There's a most frequently used, which um, obviously stores the, the things that you're most frequently using. Uh, and there's an algorithm that tunes that and decides you know, when things are trending and when they're going away. Uh, and then there's a most recently used cache, which operates in the standard, um, uh, the way that most uh, page caches work. So um, I asked this when I, I've given this talk before. And as far as I know, nothing else um, has a, a page cache like this. Everything's always LRU. Um, I actually haven't done any more research. But I, I, as far as I know, that's still true. Um, so this is kind of neat. Uh, ZFS also has and supports hybrid storage. So you can use SSDs and spinning disks and get the best of both worlds in terms of density cost and performance. Um, the, the two different modes of acceleration are the L2 arc. Uh, so this is the same thing we saw earlier, the MRU and the uh, uh, MFU. Um, but instead of in main memory, it's on, on a solid state disk or some other type of fast storage. Um, the L2 arc is kind of interesting. You don't need to mirror it necessarily. Uh, this is implementation dependent. There were some bugs in, in some of the operating systems earlier on. But um, if you lose your L2 arc, uh, nothing bad happens. You're just now hitting your, uh, your main memory for your, your arc again. Actually, everything always goes through the main memory arc. The L2 arc is just another layer that, that would get hit um, and, and if potentially give you extra cache hits. Um, the S log is, uh, so if we go back and look at the um, this diagram, uh, the S log is what is part uh, of these first two layers. And this is your fast path for synchronous writes. So if you have like a database or something that's demanding an F sync for every write, um, that kind of breaks the ability to batch things into transactions and get uh, the performance wins from that. So with a, a, a S log or a, a, the intent log, these are being flushed immediately. And that's like a natural, uh, a very nice case for something with fast random uh, write or sequential write, like an SSD or uh, another fast storage. Um, ZFS is very serious about data integrity. Um, a lot of other file systems have had some kind of embarrass uh, embarrassing gaffes, like, um, for instance, the, the Linux RAID and uh, MD subsystems basically threw out write barriers for like, as long as I can remember. I think it was fixed a few years ago, but um, that used to really annoy me uh, because you can't, you, you don't have like a true representation of what is being written and when it's being written to disk. Um, this can result in all kinds of data corruption and problems. 
Um, so that kind of stuff doesn't happen in CFS. They, they got all that stuff right from the get-go. Um, the ZIL is only for synchronous writes. So like if you have 100 gigabytes allocated to your ZIL, you're probably not going to get that much benefit from it. Um, you only need enough space for the, uh, the dirty capacity. So like 8 to 16 gigabytes is enough. Um, but this also means that like adding that SSD doesn't mean that all your writes are going to be faster. Um, it does free up your spinning disks potentially to absorb more um, like synchronous or, or uh, sequential I.O. So you may get some performance benefit from uh, general workloads, but um, you still want to have enough disks to absorb your, your write uh, workload. Um, Another interesting thing, and we'll get off of this, um, the ZIL or the S-Log is basically a write-only device. The only time you're actually looking at that is when um, your system crashes. So when it comes back up, it reads whatever's in the ZIL and, and writes that out uh, and gets you back into a consistent transaction group. So um, setting up CFS is pretty easy on most operating systems these days. There's a PPA uh, from the OpenZFS folks, and it's pretty much do the, the normal dance to get your PPA added, and then app get install Ubuntu ZFS, and you're up and running. Um, so that's fine as long as you're not booting from ZFS. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, like a root file system on ZFS, you, you will have a little bit more work to do. Um, and I would recommend just consulting the, uh, the OpenZFS wiki for information on that. Um, when Hans introduced me, uh, he mentioned this, that on, on FreeBSD, um, it's part of the base installer. Um, so you can just go ahead and run through the menu options and get a, a, a root ZFS install. Um, and the bootloader supports this. Uh, pretty nice. Um, obviously, I, I didn't cover Red Hat. Uh, it's very similar to Ubuntu. You add a yum repo um, and do a, an install. Um, Illumos is similar to FreeBSD. It's just baked into the operating system and the installer, so you can uh, get that up and running pretty easily. Um, there's one other platform, Mac OS X. Uh, it's the least mature of these four operating systems, but you can add... Um, a, a, the OSX port and use that as well. Hans? I was going to say, is DFS is available for Ubuntu in the base repositories, but it's an older version? Uh, as far as I know, no. It, I, it, I, I don't know what, what Ubuntu's policy on licensing is. It could probably live in universe if they wanted it to. Um, but for the time being, it's, it's uh, the open ZFS PPA. Uh, cuddle CDDL for the it's like a source code or a file level license okay. um, so when you link it you're allowed to build it and distribute it yourself um, there's like some people are hesitant about distributing it beyond that um, I think those fears are kind of unfounded uh, they use the, the way it, it loads at runtime it's a kernel module so it's very similar to how like the NVIDIA driver would work um, and there's enough prior art. Since it's on four operating systems, it would be really hard to say that ZFS was a derivative of the Linux kernel. Um, but that's politics. Um, no. Everything uh, exists in a portability layer. Um, so creating a, a pool is pretty easy. Um, the, the zpool command is how you interact with this. In this case, I'm just creating uh, a RAID Z1 of uh, four Linux uh, raw hard disks. Um, below that, if we want to add an S-log, uh, that's your write, your asynchronous write performance. Um, that's just a, another addition. The same thing with the ARC. Um, replacing a disk in a pool, this would be like if you have a, a hard drive failure. Um, you pull the disk, put in a new one, and then run the replace command. Uh, when I did these slides, um, Linux didn't have a event daemon. That's been fixed. It's in the OpenZFS, or the, the ZFS on Linux project, actually. 
It's called uh, Z, uh, Z, I think it's like ZFS event daemon. And this watches the kernel messages and notices when a hard drive dies and then it can swap one in from your free pool. Uh, FreeBSD has something very similar in a project branch. It's unfortunately not in stable or current yet. Um, so you would have to manually do your, your hot spare uh, replacement. So this is, uh, unfortunately that doesn't show up very well. Um, this is just running the zpool status command. Um, all, all I was trying to show here is that there is a three-way, uh, a, 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 a mirror uh, striped three ways, so a total of six drives. Um, and this is also a view where you can see if you have like hard drive or integrity errors, check some errors, um, things like that. Uh, you generally want to uh, schedule something called a scrub, depending on, on what kind of uh, data you're talking about, like either weekly or biweekly or monthly. A scrub is um, where the, the file system will go through all of the active data and rerun the checksums and tell you if it differs from what's stored. Um, this is where you prevent silent data corruption. So while that stuff is stored on the disk and it was assumed to be good when it was written, uh, you know, things can flip on the disk or you can have some type of faulty hardware um, you know, during the read, when you're reading that back. Uh, the scrub's gonna find that and it will try and repair them if it can or it'll let you know um, where the, which files are incorrect. Uh, since ZFS is integrated with the pooling storage layer, it's kind of interesting. When you do a scrub, it's only going to scrub the actual files, the actual data. So if you have like a two terabyte array, but you only have two gigabytes of files on it, you're only gonna scrub two gigabytes. When you replace a disk, you're only gonna repair the differential of that disk in that, in that two gigabyte um, usage. Uh, so it's kind of nice, like this is a, a big win over um, block level RAID, uh, either hardware or software. So um, by default, uh, I would recommend running with compression. Uh, the LZ4 co compression algorithm is really fast at extracting and um, gets reasonable levels of, of compression. Um, this is available in all four operating systems. Um, and you're trading like a negligible amount of CPU for faster reads and writes, uh, especially on spinning disks. Um, so to create a file system, uh, you can, once you have a pool, you can add, uh, you can stack on file system hierarchy. Um, so you can use this like you would traditionally use something like LVM in, in Linux or, or other platforms. Um, once you have file systems, and especially with a hierarchy, you can snapshot them. Uh, here I'm just making a simple snapshot of tank slash derp and calling it my snap. Um, once you run the uh, snapshot, um, it's frozen in time, and because the FS is copy on write, the uh, the root or, or the the, the non-snapshot is going to keep evolving and, and changing. Uh, so the 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 storage use of the snapshot will grow as the file system turns. Um, that's you know something you you have to keep your snapshots in check so you don't use all your disk space up. Um, but you can send, uh, uh, the most, the, the easiest thing to do is to simply roll back a snapshot. Um, you can also make them visible in a dot directory uh, where you can like just use your standard Unix file utilities to go and look at them. But the really cool thing is to use send and receive. Um, send is a way to take that snapshot and the snapshot's atomic, so like when you run that snapshot command, that's a point in time. There's no more churn on that on that disk you, or on that on that volume. Um, so you can send that to a backup server, and it's totally consistent. Um, this is really nice for a lot of different workloads. Like if you were to use something like rsync or or uh, some type of file backup, that that file system could be changing out from under you while you're running the rsync and then you have to do 
this continuous process and it may actually not even be possible to get a consistent view without um, freezing the file system. Um, there's one other thing I talked about briefly. Zvols are just uh, a raw. That, so the, you get the pooled storage and the transactional storage, but then that's exposed as a raw uh, block device. This is a really nice way to run VMs uh, on any platform, be it uh, KVM or Beehive or whatever else. Um, it's actually one of the fastest ways to do it, too. Um, and of course, you get the, the benefits of snapshots and send and receive when you're doing that. Uh, so just some tips. I would basically always recommend running um, compression with LZ4. Um, dedupe is another thing where you can use the checksums to get rid of redundant data and just store a single copy of it. Um, I wouldn't recommend running that in most cases. If you have a dedicated storage server, um, it might make sense, but it, it really balloons the, the RAM requirements. Uh, prefer mirroring and striping. This is actually true for, for more than just CFS. I, I, I recommend this uh, even with hard, other hardware and software raids. Um, ZFS likes RAM. The more RAM you have, the more that will get used by the ARC. Um, by HBAs, RAID cards are not really good for ZFS. You want to give it a raw disk. Uh, and in most, t in most cases, this is a cost saving, so it's kind of nice. Um, and I, I personally trust the ZFS code a lot more than I do uh, hardware RAID firmwares. Um, pass the disk in raw to ZFS. This is just because it, it's, it will get some things right, like enabling the write cache and whatnot um, that you might not do manually. Um, so if you're running it on Linux, uh, you probably want to limit the arc right now. Uh, this is just uh, something that, uh, because of the way the, the Linux memory manager works, uh, it, it's actually not able to reclaim the arc quickly enough. Um, this will be fixed in a future ZFS on Linux uh, release, but for now, I would recommend just limiting the arc to some reasonable amount uh, so the system has enough headroom to do whatever else it is it's doing. Um, decrease the swappiness and um, I'm not sure what I meant by the last bullet point actually. So that's my slides. Um, I'm open to questions or comments about anything. Does it use the same versioning as the previous D implementation? Yes, so the, the OpenZFS people um, Solaris, when Sun was doing it, they would increment it monotonically. So there was like ZFS 29, then 30. Um, the last open source one, I think, was 29. Then the OpenZFS people said, all right, we're going to come up with our own way to track features. Um, so they changed the version to 5,000. Uh, so all of these, those four platforms use the, the pool version of 5,000. And then there's a thing called feature flags. So as the operating systems develop new features, they can enable those with flags and then submit that back to OpenZFS. And then as long as uh, the, the other implementations have compatible flags, you can share that storage between all four platforms. Um, the older pool formats can be generally imported into any of the four. So like if you have a Z pool that was created with um, like OpenSolaris or Solaris 10, you can generally import that into any of the four OpenCFS. But you can't re export You couldn't put it back into the older, like the Solaris. Uh, it, it's, it's one way, generally. Um, that's actually not true. Um, you, you, have to, you have to manually mutate the array to, to, to make it a one-way thing. So if you have an older pool, it'll stay on that version, and you could actually bring it back to the older platform. Uh, and, and likewise with the feature flags. You have to actually opt in to feature flags. So you could format it on an older version, and as long as you don't uh, do a zpool upgrade, it would, it would actually work and continue to be able to be um, transported. Yep. Is it a recommendation similar to on uh, FreeBSD, where it's about one uh, gigabyte of RAM per terabyte? Yeah, that's the traditional lure. Um, I think after you pass, it, it, it depends on your workload, really. Like, 
um, as long as you have like I, I'd say like eight gigs that aren't being used by the application, um, that's enough RAM to cover like the pretty large storage pools. Um, but the more RAM you give it, the better performance you're going to get because of the the arc, the way the arc works. Um, where you really run into problems is with dedupe. Um, that I, I forget the rule of thumb, but it goes up like five x I think for RAM to terabyte. You were talking about sending snapshots back and forth. Can you basically keep a live mirror on a different system? Yes. So um, I'm actually doing that, and it basically you're just doing back-to-back -back replication. It's like the way a database would do like a log ship. Um, it's the exact same concept. Uh, so you potentially do have a period of loss there, but it's consistent at least uh, on both sides. Um, and then you can, as a human, you can make a judgment on whether that loss is acceptable for your. Do you know what the up. increment is or the low end on that is? It's just dependent on the um, the amount of churn. Like if you have the bandwidth to keep it up, it would probably be like less than a handful of seconds. Uh, but it's asynchronous because of the log ship. That's important to point out. If you have to replace a drive, how is the rebuilding process compared to uh, hardware RAID or other uh, RAID uh, options? Right. So your your most other RAID options are block based. So when you put in like a four terabyte disk, you're having to recompute parity and rebuild four terabytes of blocks. Um, ZFS only does the actual storage used. Uh, so the resilver process could potentially take like no time at all. Um, but if you do have to rebuild four terabytes of data, um, it's probably going to be limited by uh, the, the drive speed more than anything. Um, if you have active workloads, the rebuild process has a priority. And you can set that with syscontrols, um, what, you know, what you want to prioritize. Can you talk about how uh when you're doing the resilvering process with another hard drive dies, how that works? So that would be dependent on uh, what the structure of your Z pool is. And um, that would be the most important thing. So like, say you have, um, you're doing striping, uh, mirrored striping. Uh, as long as it's not an adjacent disk in your, in, your, uh, in your mirror, you could potentially suffer however many stripes you have of disk failures. Um, and the file, everything's going to keep on ticking as long as you can get the, those disks replaced and resilvered in time. Um, if it's one of the parity levels, uh, so a RAID Z1 can survive a single disk loss uh, per VDEV. You can do, of course, you can stack uh, like the, the RAID Z and striping, um, and you generally do that for performance. Um, but a RAID Z2 can survive two disks failing, and a RAID Z3 can survive three uh, failures. And those um, those are just those can be you know any drive. They're they're not there's no adjacency unless it's in a striped configuration. So I know we're running RAID Z2 so that when remote hands replaces the wrong disk, <laughs> that's what I run at my house actually. Yeah. Yeah, if you want, uh, I mean, if you're not running uh, striping and mirroring for some reason um, anymore, I, I think you should probably just do like a two or three way mirror. Um, but it, it's really dependent on the number of hard drives you have and what you're trying to get out of the system. Uh, there are a lot of myths that surround ZFS2. I would recommend reading the, the OpenZFS wiki for like how to correctly size and, and stripe and mirror and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, how many disks to put in your RAID groups. Um, the internet will lead you astray if you don't go to the right place. In the back. Um, when you say decrease swappiness, uh, do you ever uh, eliminate swappiness? Swap? Uh, I don't prefer to. Um, and that's actually kind of operating system dependent. I would definitely not recommend doing that on Linux. Um, especially with CFS, you're going to swap a little bit because of uh, 
the way that kernel does memory management. Do you push it as far as you can in terms of decreasing it, or you just kind of cut the number? Right yeah, I like to I like to run it at like one uh, personally with ZFS servers because I want the arc to be the primary th thing using free uh, memory. Um, you can run swap on ZFS, which is I, I haven't done it on Linux, but it's it's pretty well supported on FreeBSD. And then you get the benefits of uh, the pooled storage, so you can survive hard drive loss or whatever. In the back, yep. You keep saying ARC requires memory. That's ECC memory only, correct? Uh, that's the recommendation, because if you're using ZFS without ECC isn't necessarily any worse than any, any other file system with, without ECC. It's just that ZFS is making these guarantees to you that, yes, end-to-end, -end, this, this storage is correct. Um, when you don't have ECC memory, uh, you're, you're adding entropy into the things that are supposed to not have that. So, um, you, you know, the checksumming process and, and when it's working on the raw data. Um, so for, for any serious use, you should probably be using ECC RAM. But... Like, I run ZFS on my laptop, and that's parity RAM. Um, I mean, the, the risk of that to me is very little. So um, if you're interested in this stuff, check out OpenZFS, uh, their project page and wiki. Um, ZFS on Linux has some good resources. Uh, FreeBSD man pages. Um, all really, really well-written documentation around all this, and I, I'd encourage you to take a look. Thank you.